Amen. God keeps his promises. Is anybody glad to know that this morning? Look at your neighbor and tell him God keeps his promises. It's so good to see all of you in the house of the Lord today. Thank you for being with us to worship this beautiful Sunday morning. We're going to continue in this sermon series we've been in for the past several weeks. And I don't know about you, but I have enjoyed this sermon series on glory days. Man, living your promised land life right here and right now. We're, we're unpacking this story from the book of Joshua and how Joshua triumphantly and victoriously led the children of Israel into that promised land, and he led them into seven years of promised blessing. How many know the children of Israel were unstoppable? They were unrelenting. They were going to receive and get from God everything that he had promised them that they could have. They watched the, the waters of, of the Jordan River, man, separate. They, they watched the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. They watched the sun stand still. And the moon refused to come out just to give them time to wage war and defeat their enemy. Every king of Canaan was defeated until Israel had walked in and laid claim to every square inch of the property that God has said was theirs. And I'm here to tell you today, you and I ought to be willing to do the same. And we ought to walk boldly into every promise that God has decreed and declared over our life. They weren't going to stop until they were flowing, thriving in that abundant, promised life that God said they could have. And can I remind you of something today? God has promised the same thing to you and to me. He has promised us a blessed, abundant life. This is what John chapter 1, verse number 4 says. In Him was Life, and that life was the light of all mankind. In him is life today. Now, I'm going to make a very profound theological statement. If you want to experience the fullness of life, a prerequisite to that is you have to have a relationship with the giver of life. Somebody say amen. So many folks today are searching for meaning and purpose to their life. I want to declare something today. You're not going to find the meaning to your life in the bottom of a bottle. You're not going to find meaning to your life in a pill. You're not going to find meaning for your life in a relationship. You're not going to find meaning for your life in your career. But you will find the meaning for your life. Weave through the pages of God's holy word. You'll find meaning and purpose for your life when you get alone in your prayer closet and you're calling out to God and asking Him to direct your steps. You'll find meaning for your life with your hands stretched toward heaven declaring the majesty and the glory of God. In Him there is meaning to life. In Him there is purpose to life. And in Him there is fullness to your life today. The psalmist declared this, you will make known to me in Psalms chapter 16 verse 11, you'll make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. How many have found joy in the presence of the Lord this morning? In His presence there is meaning and purpose and joy and abundancy to your life. It's found in the presence of God. How many believe this morning, really believe, that God has a promised land life for you? Do you believe that today? Living a blessed life, it's more than just a motto, Kathy. It's more than just something we say. It's something we believe, man, at the core of who we are. That we have an inheritance from the Lord. We have great and precious promises, the Bible says, that are ours for the taking. Simply because of who we are. These days can be. These days are meant to be. These days shall be, I declare. Our Glory days. Would you say this with me? This is the declaration we've been making over the, the past few weeks. Come on, say these words. These days are glory days. My past is past. And my future is bright. With God by my side, I will be all He wants me to be. Do all He wants me to do. And receive all He wants me to receive 
These days are glory days. If you believe that, would you put an amen right there? These days are glory days. Last week we talked about praying audacious prayers. I'm going to tell you, I felt the power of God from the time I stepped on the pulpit Man, until the close of service, I, I told somebody, I said, I, I thought I could have been raptured right there. Man, the presence of God was so strong. Praying audacious prayers, learning to, to pray and believe what we ask God for. I got a phone call on Monday, right after we had that powerful service preaching on the power of prayer. And it was Reverend Brad Nelson. Brother Brad, as you know, is, has transitioned to being a full-time missionary in the Philippines has moved permanently from the United States, from Dublin, Virginia. This is addressed to the Philippines. A part of that process is he's trying to sell his home. Been on the market for some time. A lot of folks have come by and seen it, but nobody's made an offer. One, right? Not, not one offer. He was praying. He's making two mortgages, paying a mortgage here in Dublin, trying to take care of the house in the Philippines. Man, believe in God that thing's going to sell. He said Sunday, we preached that message on the power of prayer. And he said Monday afternoon or Monday morning, he's sitting in his home, I think in the basement, praying, asking God, man, you got to help me with this thing. you got to move this, this house. Somebody's got to come along and buy it. And he said he started thinking about Joshua, that powerful scripture where Joshua stepped out, man, and, and prayed that audacious prayer. Let the sun stay where it's at. Don't let the moon come out until I've gotten what I need to get from you. Brad said he lifted his hand toward heaven. He said, Lord, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus that the sun would not go down, that the sun would not set tonight until somebody's made an offer on this house. And that's praying audaciously, amen. What the Bible say, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it, and it shall be yours. Man, Brad said he believed it. He said, I'm putting in the Lord's hands. I don't trust him. He said he walked out of there and the, the uh, lady called, real estate agent called and said, Brother Brad, we've got a, somebody wants to see the house this afternoon. Well, that was nothing unusual because that's happened, you know, many times before. But this particular time happened to be a God-ordained folk, folk that want to come by and see that house. They saw it at, what, 2.30, 3.30? By 5.30, they'd already called and made an offer, and it was within a few thousand dollars of his asking price. Can I tell you, somebody needs to be daring enough to step out and believe God for the impossible. Somebody needs to learn to pray those kind of mountain-moving prayer, those kind of heaven-shaking prayers when you believe God to do what you've asked Him for. Praying and believing. That's what Israel did. They believed. God said we can have that land, and they took it for what it was. It is ours. It's already got our name on it because God has declared that we shall have it. They were just waiting, man, for God to give the marching orders, and when he did, man, they walked boldly into their best days. They walked into their glory days. Let's look at our text this morning. The book of Joshua chapter 21 verses 43 through 45 says this the Lord gave to Israel all the land somebody say all all the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers and they took possession of it and dwelt in it and the Lord gave them rest all around according to all that he had sworn to their fathers Goes on and says, not a man of their enemies stood against them. But the Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. And I want you to focus on this last verse here. Not a word failed. Somebody needs to underscore that in your Bible. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to Israel. But all, say all again. All, not some, not part, not half, but all came to pass. The thought this morning that we're talking about is no falling words. That simply means that God does not speak carelessly. That means God does not speak casually. 
I want you to know that what he says, you can take it to the bank this morning. Joshua said not a word failed of any good thing the Lord had promised. How many of you here this morning can look back over your life and say there were times I didn't know when. There were times I didn't know how. But God always showed up right on time and not a word has failed that God has spoken over my life. Not a word failed of any good thing the Lord had promised. Numbers 23, 19 says God is not a man that he should lie. Or the son of man, that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? We live today in a world of falling words. Can I tell you something that I'm sure you already know? Man's word doesn't really account for a whole lot anymore. There was a time when you could sign a contract with a handshake and a man's word. But not today. Why? Because today we live in a world of broken promises. We live in a world of empty vows. We say, till death do us part, but we don't mean it. We say, I'll pray for you, but we usually don't do it. We say, Lord, if you get me out of this mess, I'll go to church on Sunday. But the weekend rolls around and we forget all about it. We tell people, I'll never let you down, but as hard as we try, we just can't live up to it. But I want to remind you of a truth this morning. In a world of falling words, one thing is for sure. His word remains steadfast and secure. His word shall remain forever in your life. God is a covenant-keeping kind of God. Psalms 105 verse 8 says he remembers his covenant forever. The promise that he made for a thousand generations. Max Licato made this statement in that opening video. So there's ever been a a central theme to the book of Joshua. It's this thought. God keeps his promises. But how important is that? Does it really matter for us to know that God keeps his promises I want you to know it matters when you're afraid to send your child to school of a morning. But you remember the word says he will cover you with his feathers. And under his wings you shall take refuge. And you know that he keeps his promises. It matters when you leave the doctor's office with a bad report. But you remember the word says I will restore health unto you. And I will heal you of your wounds. And you know that God keeps his promises. It matters when you feel like you can't make it one more day because of grief and depression. But you remember that the word says, weeping may endure through the night, but joy comes in the morning. And you know that God keeps his promises. Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 23 says, let us hold fast to our profession of faith, knowing that he who promised is faithful. Aren't you glad today to know that you serve a faithful God, that he's faithful and true? No wonder the songwriter declared, great is thy faithfulness. Even when I fail him, when I'm not faithful to him, I want you to know God shall remain faithful to me. He's never forsook me. He's never let me down. And he shall remain faithful and true to the end of the world and beyond. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Thank God he's faithful today. Praise his name. There's a few things I want to draw your attention to about today. When we consider the promises of God found specifically in the story of Joshua. The first thing is this. God's promises are sure. That means they're certain. That means they are indisputable. That means they are guaranteed. Isn't that a good word? Guaranteed. Man, you like to know you finish school in this amount of time, you'll be guaranteed that you'll get a diploma. I was glad the other day when I saw a retirement report. Had to list on my 401k a guaranteed interest rate. I said, thank you, Lord. We like guarantees, amen. Here's what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14. Listen to this. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit is God's guarantee that He will give us the inheritance that he has promised us. 
Another version said the Spirit of God is our deposit. He's a deposit on something greater that is yet to come. He is a guarantee in your life that what God has spoken, what He's decreed, what He's declared, you can take it to the bank. You shall inherit what God has said is yours. The Spirit is our guarantee that every promise from God will come to pass. What did Joshua 21, 43 say? The Lord gave to Israel all the land which he had sworn to give. See, God had made a promise to Israel. And he was going to keep that promise because his promises are sure. Some folks have, have claimed to have counted the promises in the Bible. I read reports that said there are as many as 3,000 promises Recorded in the Word of God. Another report I looked up said somebody else had reviewed and studied it. They found 7,000 promises within the pages of God's Holy Word. Somebody else even said they had reported there were 8,000 promises found recorded in your Bible. And I'm going to tell you something today. I don't know for sure how many promises there are. But I do know this. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse number 20 says for no matter how many promises God has made they are all yes and amen in Christ Jesus our Lord. Somebody hear this preacher today. Whatever God has promised you can bank on it. Whatever God's promised you you can stand on it today because his promises are sure he is faithful and true this morning. Every promise from God. Yes and amen in Christ Jesus. I read this story about a gentleman by the name of James Ryle. At the age of six years old, his parents dropped him off at an orphanage in Dallas, Texas because they just didn't want him anymore. He spent the majority of his childhood there in that orphanage where he was mentally and physically abused. Finally, about the age of 16, James had had all he could take, and he, he left the orphanage and went out on his own. Had no job. He had no money. He was living on the street. Next thing you know, he starts drinking pretty heavily. He starts doing drugs pretty heavily. He's intoxicated. He gets behind the wheels of an of automobile, has a terrible automobile accident, and it took the life. It killed his best friend. He gets arrested. And he's charged with negligent homicide. His life is spiraling out of control. He gets out of the, 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 the prison there momentarily while he's waiting to stand before a judge and a jury. And he doesn't have any money. They're going to appoint him a lawyer. But he knows, man, I need something better than that. If I'm going to help myself, he ain't got no money. So he starts selling drugs again to get money to pay for a lawyer to get him out of the thing he was arrested for for selling drugs. And he gets arrested again. Put back in jail. His lawyer come to him and said, they are going to throw the book at you. This is it. You're facing 20 years in a maximum state penitentiary. There's no way out. His life, man, was just made a mess. Shambles left of his life now to about an 18-year-old man. And, man, he falls on his knees and... He's weeping, man, just asking somebody, if there's anybody out there that can help me do something with this mess of a life that I've created. He said for the first time in his life, he heard the audible voice of God that said, James, I've created you for something more. And I have a purpose for your life. He said, if you will surrender to me the broken fragments of what's left of your life, I will put the pieces back together. And I would do remarkable things that you know it had to be me. And I'll use you to tell your testimony of the goodness of God to the world. So he repented, I mean wholeheartedly repented and surrendered his life to God and said, Lord, if you can do something with a mess of a life that I've created, I give it to you today. He went and stood before the judge facing 20 years. And the judge gave him the minimum Sentence that he could have gotten, which was two. He went to prison in 12 months. They got enrolled in an early release program. And he was let out of prison on good behavior. He walked out of the Texas State Penitentiary in December of 1970. 
with nothing. Not knowing where he was going to go, where he was going to put his head down that night, what his next step was going to be. But he said, Lord, you made me a promise. And I believe you are a promise-keeping kind of God. And I believe you'll fulfill what you promised me in that jail cell, man, when I turn my heart and life over to you. Sure enough, God began to open doors. James got an invite to a local church in town. They put him up in this little, little quarters they had for a guest and let him sleep there. And he began to share his testimony with the men of that church. And the next thing you know, another church in town finds out what he's sharing, what God's done. And they said, how about sending that man over to my church and share his testimony? There's some people that, that need to hear it in my church. And then he gets called to another church. And would you come over and maybe share your testimony? And could you share a little bit of the word of God with us? And the next thing you know, old James gets the call to preach. God said, I'm calling you to preach the gospel to the people around the world. And he begins to travel from church to church and he's an evangelist and all of a sudden he moves to Colorado and, and this overseer calls him and said I've got a church I'd like you to consider being the pastor of it he becomes the, the lead pastor of the Bethel a ch Fellowship Church in Colorado in 1982 and he begins to attend the University of Colorado football games and gets kind of acquainted with the players and some of the coaches and they said how would you like to be the chaplain of the University of Colorado football team and from there he meets the coach and develops this relationship with a man by the name of Bill McCartney and the two of them kind of share similar stories and they start sharing their testimony with churches and God puts it in their heart to launch a men's ministry so in 1990 they had their very first meeting with 72 men and since that time they've reached more than 1 million men around the world with a little ministry known as Promise Keepers can I tell somebody today that He's a covenant-keeping kind of God. If He's made a promise in your life, you can take it to the bank. You can stand on it. His promises are sure today. He shall keep every promise. His word shall remain forever. Remembers His covenant for a thousand generations, He said. Why? Because God's promises, they are sure today. Another thing we can, another element we can take away from Joshua's story about the promises of God are this. God's promises are steadfast. Steadfast. That means they are immovable. Can I tell you, every devil in hell cannot stop God's plan for your life. They're immovable. They are unalterable. Regardless of your situation, regardless of your circumstance. Here's another deep theological statement, man. You might want to write, I underline this in my message. It spoke to me so much. Your situation doesn't dictate the ability of God to execute His promises in your life. I'm going to say that again. Your situation. What you're going through right now, church, listen to me. It does not define, it does not dictate to God what he's capable of. It doesn't change the fact that with man it might be impossible, but not with God. Because with God all things are possible. Joshua 21, 44 said the Lord gave them rest all around according to all that he had sworn to their fathers. In other words, he gave them everything that he promised their fathers, or we could say their father, years before. Do you know this promise was 600 years plus in the making? God promised Abraham around 2000 B.C. In Genesis 12, 7, To your descendants I will give this land. They were holding fast to a promise through the time of Abraham. They were holding fast to that promise through the time of Isaac, and through the time of Jacob, through the time of Joseph, through the time of that 400-year bondage. In Egypt, they were holding fast to that promise, man, when Moses came on the scene and delivered them from Egypt. 
They kept holding on for 40 years. So they walked around in the wilderness. God has a promised land life for us. And now all of a sudden, here in Joshua, they're standing face to face with destiny. They're standing face to face with a promise that has overcome so much opposition but was just about to be fulfilled in their lives. I wonder how many promises God has made to you that the devil's tried to convince you will never come to pass. I wonder how long you've been praying, how long you've been waiting for the promise that your children would be saved. How long have you been praying and waiting that you'd see that financial breakthrough that God has promised? How long have you been praying and waiting that that healing would come? How long have you been praying and waiting that that addictive behavior and bondage would be broken, but you've waited and waited and seemingly the problem has grown worse and worse? I want to remind you that Joseph had to wait 13 years for the fulfillment of a promise. David had to wait for 15 years for the fulfillment of a promise. Israel had to wait for 600 years for the fulfillment of their promise. I remember a time when I was 16 years old in this church. Man, pray and asking God, what's your direction for my life? What, what is it? I knew there was a calling there, but I just didn't know what direction God wanted me to go in. I'll never forget Pastor Philip Napier was here preaching revival. One of the greatest men of God that I've ever had the privilege to hear preach the word. He called me out that particular night of revival and called me to the front. I've got this on cassette tape. That's how long ago this has been. In my office. I ain't got nothing to play it on, but I've got it, bless God. On a cassette tape where he called me to the front of the church and he laid hands on me. and He said, here's what God has for you to do. You're going to sing and you're going to preach. And he said, you will not leave this house of worship until God's perfect plan has been fulfilled in your life. That promise was 17 years in the making. Until the age of 33, I stepped into that position. I had no idea God would call me to as the lead pastor of this church. Why are you saying all that, Pastor? I'm reminding you of what 2 Peter 3, 9 says. God is not slow in keeping His promises, as some understand slowness. But according to the book of Habakkuk, it said there is an appointed time. Though it tarries, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, for it shall certainly come to pass. You might have waited for a long time. You might have considered giving up. The devil might have tried to convince you to throw in the towel on your promise but I've come by to tell somebody to hold on there is an appointment for you on God's calendar and it's got your name on it there is an appointed time and it shall whatever God has spoken whatever he's promised in your life it shall come to pass why because God's promises are steadfast they will remain Forever. Finally, I'm closing with this. The musicians want to come back. God's promises are sure. God's promises are steadfast. And the promises of God are secure. That means they're dependable. That means they are reliable. That means when earth all around is sinking sand on Christ the solid rock on the promises of God you can stand I saw the craziest thing on the internet within the past month or so you see a lot of crazy things on the internet don't you it was these teenagers and I guess it's a game maybe the teenagers will know perhaps that they play a bunch of them will get together and they go to the mall, they go to they go out to eat, go to a restaurant, they go into school, wherever they are. There's a bunch of teenagers. One of them will shout out the word trust. And when they say trust, they fall backwards. I mean stiff as a board and they drop like a rock. 
their friends, when they hear the word trust, they got to throw down whatever's in their hand and catch their friend. I watched them in a restaurant. Kids got a plate full of food. Trust. <laughs> Drinks went there. French fries went there. True story. I thought that is the craziest thing I've ever seen. And his kids just dropping. If I shouted trust in front of Alicia, I'd hit the floor. <laughs> be the end of that. I'd be in a hospital where I'd be. But their friends, every time I watched this crazy thing, when the kid would fall, they caught him. I ain't never seen reflexes so fast in my life. None of them. I watched several. I don't know, half a dozen maybe. Not, a, not one kid hit the floor. Man, their friends were ready. They had faith in their friends that they were reliable enough, that they were dependable enough, they trusted in them enough that they would keep them from falling. I came across an old hymn that made a similar declaration. It says, standing on the promises, I shall not fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Anybody know this? Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. You can stand there this morning. You can put your trust in God's promises. Joshua 21, 45. Not a word failed. Not one word that God spoke did not happen. Not one word failed of any good thing the Lord promised Israel but Joshua said it all came to pass heaven and earth will pass away but the word of the Lord shall endure forever you can stand on his promises today you can stand feet firmly planted that as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. You can stand with your feet firmly planted. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement, the payment for my peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed in the name of Jesus. You can stand securely planted the promise that the anointing of God will destroy the yoke of bondage. I come by to remind you today in case you've forgotten His promises are sure His promises are steadfast and His promises are secure in your life. He's promised you glory days and they shall be yours. Jesus' name. Would you stand to your feet this morning? I'm going to ask every head bowed, every eye closed for just a moment. I want to ask a, a really important question. The most important question that could ever be asked of you is where's your relationship at with God today? There's only one thing that can stop God's plan for your life. And that's if you're walking in sin. If you're living in disobedience to your heavenly Father, man, and your life is separated from Him, your relationship with Him is not where, where it's supposed to be. Isaiah said it will cause Him to turn His face from us. So I'm going to give you an opportunity right now. I want to give everybody in this house a chance and to make a refresh commitment to the Lord today. If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I, I know I'm not where I need to be with God. I know that, man, there's, there's some stuff in my life that I need to get under the blood. There, there's some things there, man, that have, have separated me from Him. I'm not walking in, in right relationship and fellowship with God. And I want that to change today. Would you just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, that's me. God bless you. There's one. Anybody else? God bless you. There's two, three. I see in the back. God bless you. Four. God bless you. God bless you.
bless you, dear. It's five. Anybody else? Pastor, that's me. And I, I need to get this thing right with God before I let God bless you. Man, I see your hand. There's six, I believe. Anybody else? Say, Pastor, that's me. I need to get this right before I leave this house today. And I want to know that His promises for me, they're yes and amen in Christ Jesus. That I can have what He said I can have. That I'm a king's kid. A joint heir with Jesus, the Bible said. Anybody else before we pray? Anybody else? One, one last chance. God bless you. There, there's about six hands that were raised. Would everybody just pray this? Pray with me. Would you say, Dear Lord Jesus? Come on, say it again. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. And what I need is forgiveness. I'm asking you to come into my heart today to wash me clean, to forgive me of my sins, to help me have a fresh start today. I declare my life is going to be different. I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, I accept you as my Lord. I confess you as my Savior. I believe you died and rose again. That in you I am a new creation. And every promise of God is mine for the taking. In Jesus' name, amen.